Nestled in the Berkshires of Massachusetts, the Norman Rockwell Museum is celebrating its 45th anniversary showcasing the work of America's iconic illustrator. Created in the final decade of his life, Norman Rockwell established a trust to ensure his artistic legacy would thrive long after his passing. Each year, tens of thousands of visitors flock to this 36-acre treasure trove of history dedicated to the art of illustration. When you think about our whole collection, not counting just the paintings, we have thousands of objects now. Besides his, his artwork, his reference photography, his correspondence, fan mail, his uh, bifocals that he used to, to paint with, um, and, pipe. and his pipes, yeah, his famous pipes. Once a carriage barn, the studio was bequeathed to the museum in 1978. So in order not to disturb the family home, which is where the studio was originally, uh, we waited until uh, Mrs. Rockwell passed away in 1986, and then um, cut the building in half and put it on a flatbed truck and drove it out here. <laughs> 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 The Norman Rockwell Museum is only one of a handful in the world to have the original working space of the artist on the property. So we had Einar Hamburg, uh, a, a local craftsperson, install these large windows that are right behind us and that gave Rockwell a lot of natural light. That's what he liked to paint using right. as opposed to uh, incandescent light. And in, when we were inside you could see that some of, the, some of the blinds were drawn but he would never have had that. Right, on a nice sunny day, he would want as much light as he could. He liked to stay in the studio as long as he could, maybe 10 or 12 hours a day. He would frame his work early, so it would be ready to go. Inside, a replica of the 1960 Saturday Evening Post cover titled The Golden Rule is on display, along with memorabilia in the exact spot the artist used them. The brushes, the paints, the photographs. There's a bureau in there that actually only has three drawers, but in a painting called The Discovery, a little boy was posing in front of it, and Rockwell realized the boy looked a little too tall, so he added another drawer. One of the things that you notice about Norman Rockwell's paintings, uh, most of them, ones that we're familiar with, is that he focuses on everyday people. When he started his career, he had access to a re uh, professional models in New York City area, but when he moved to Vermont in the late 30s, he didn't have that luxury anymore. So he really had to figure out a way to, to resolve that and ended up uh, approaching his neighbors. Rockwell didn't use professional models for his work generally. He hired people from his own town and he paid them $5 a session. $5 was a pretty big chunk of change back in the day. It's said Rockwell worked on as many as four or five canvases at a time. He fashioned himself a director using his townsfolk as muses. As a result, he honed his sense of style and the everyman aspect of his work. Photography allowed him to illustrate with much more detail. As a result of that, that really honed his style. You know, what we know is the sort of Norman Rockwell kind of look. So the subject matter, the models were perfect for that. Even downtown Stockbridge became the focal point of his illustrative reach. Dining at the Red Lion Inn is a step back in time. The Red Lion was so important to Norman Rockwell that he actually included it in three of his works. It's lunchtime and eight busloads of hungry visitors have come to the Terrace Cafe for a respite from sightseeing and leaf peeping. All of the delicious food served is prepared daily at the Red Lion Kitchen. Sandwiches have names like Rosie's Special, The Gossips, and Freedom From Want. In 1943, inspired by a presidential address to Congress, Rockwell painted the Four Freedoms. The paintings are part of the museum's permanent collection. What really clicked for him was, again, his neighbors. He attended a town meeting and saw this man, a, a, a farmer, being able to you know, step up into the meeting hall and declare his own beliefs and have his fellow uh, townsmen uh, tolerant of that and giving him a, a chance to speak. While much of his work is viewed as homespun Americana, he was actually quite progressive in his later years, depicting the Civil Rights Movement. He really chronicled the 20th century from the first uh, transatlantic flight, Charles Lindbergh, all the way to Man's First Steps on the Moon, which he chronicled in the late 60s. The story is the first and last thing, he once said. Rockwell's work portrays an appreciation for simpler times folksy elegance in painstaking detail. 
but he also showcased an air of whimsy and humor in a work aptly named Triple Self-Portrait. He thought he would um, poke fun at himself a bit and come up with his own um, self-portrait like many artists have done. Now the fun thing about this picture was that Rockwell has brought you in on the joke. Pretty ingenious, he thought that up himself. Many famous directors have derived inspiration from Rockwell, names you might know. Two of the most notable were Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, who become great friends of the museum. Movies like Forrest Gump, uh, directed by Bob Zemeckis, I think of his work and um, you know, it has a sort of Rockwell tone to it. Things like uh, Back to the Future were, were very much this sort of America that Rockwell presented. The museum presents a glimpse into Norman Rockwell the man as an everyman and the journey of a life well lived. His unique eye on life captured on canvas is a slice of America now immortalized for generations to come. For American Lifestyle TV, I'm Tanya Walker.